Welcome to another episode of Thinking Like a Bank, where we show you how to think like a bank by applying the same strategies and principles that banks use to help you find more financial freedom in your life. I'm your host, Sarah Ibrahim. Today, I'm interviewing Michael Johnson. He's an author, master NLP practitioner, business mentor, and investor. He works with businesses to help them attain the necessary solutions to save them money, improve the revenue, and create more meaningful impact for their team, their customers, and themselves. With over 30 years of teaching, coaching, and mentoring experience, Michael brings a unique and effective approach to taking businesses to the next level using the power of business choreography. Michael, welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much. I appreciate you inviting me, and it's it's exciting to be here. Thank you for joining us. It was nice speaking to you on your podcast a couple of weeks ago. It was a pleasure being on your podcast. Before we jump into, so kind of like to give the audience a little bit of feedback on what this podcast is going to be about, we're going to talk about like, what you do and like consulting. Can we start off with more about your background and what you do? Oh my gosh. I've got a crazy, crazy background. I actually started off as a a professional ballroom dancer. Uh, I was uh, on the professional circuit for about 10 years. I had a a long amateur career before that, before I went pro. And, uh, and during that time, I kind of learned the, the ins and outs of being self-employed and and an entrepreneur and uh always always trying to start a business build a business and during that time i i started a personal development company uh worked as a coo of a software company for a while uh you know it's been kind of a crazy journey i've bootstrapped i think over six businesses now um i own now uh i think over six as well uh we we do a ton of investing uh we we try to invest in education businesses and various others if they fit within our portfolio so it's been kind of a wild ride but but a huge huge uh spectrum of of things along the way but being a professional athlete in the in the ballroom ranks i mean a lot of people don't realize it's it's a sport it's a it's a art as well but it's a huge sport and it takes its toll on your body and so during that time i had to kind of figure out some other things that i could do to uh save the knees i wanted to be able to to uh, <laughs> walk later on in life no it, it it does take its toll on your body so it's it's been a fun ride and been a crazy journey well wow, awesome i mean i could tell that you you've done so many different things like do you see any sim? Were there any similarities between these different types of businesses that you ran and owned? Oh my gosh, it, there were so many similarities, and and it, it's crazy how one sort of Spider Man to the next. Uh, I realized in the profession of of education and teaching. Uh, in the dance world that I had to learn how people's brains work. And that led me to personal development and getting into that world. And as I did that, it kind of led me to working with more business owners. And as I did that and started working on entrepreneurs and businesses, I started getting into sales training and marketing and understanding how to use the personal development and the mental uh, improvements that I learned in that area to work with business owners. And then, of course, as we did that, I started getting into more marketing and more uh, more business tactics and understanding operations as I ran that software company. From there, kind of leapfrogged into uh, the natural, I think, the natural progression, which was to start investing in businesses and bringing multiple businesses on board and And being able to kind of work above it and on top of it so that I could help with all of those skills, help each of those businesses grow. So I think they are all connected and in a really cool sort of way. So to fast forward to today, let's say, Michael, I see you, I meet you at a restaurant or somewhere. What do you do for for work? What's your response? Yeah, I am an investor and a business mentor. And so oftentimes we'll find businesses that need help in growing and scaling and we'll help them do that, whether it's in operations, sales, um, whether it's in scaling and growth and or preparing for exit. Sometimes it's a business owner that is just looking at how the heck am I going to get out? Retiring isn't really what they want to do, but they want to prepare for an exit in some way, shape or form. And and we've kind of become experts at doing that. So whether it's investing outright in a business and and coming in, being a partner, or whether it's purchasing a business outright, that's what I do these days. 
And what do you think are the biggest challenges with businesses exiting? Like that you've seen? Oh my seen? gosh, <laughs> huge. Well, if you're an owner operator, okay, so go ahead and silently raise your hand right now. If you're an owner operator, there are a lot of challenges because a lot of times as an owner operator, we got in and I know, like I said, I, I've bootstrapped, I think well over six companies now. And when you get in as an owner operator, you're in it for the passion. You love it. You want to change the world. You want to do your thing and bring it to as many people as you can. And a lot of times that makes you the chief uh, everything, the chief accountant, the chief operating officer, the chief take the trash out guy, <laughs> right? So it, it makes you the chief everything. And in many instances, when I go to uh, help an owner operator get to the point where they're going to exit. One of the biggest challenges is that they still think that they're doing everything or that they're the best at everything. Yeah. And I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but if you're an owner operator, you're not the best at everything. There are people that are better at just about everything you do. And it's about trying to get that switched out and turned into a position where you can do the thing that you love because you love it, but not because you have to do it to earn the money in the business. And so that's a big difference in getting you prepared for exit. And a lot of owner operators just don't understand that. And so because of that, the price of their business is probably going to be lower. And so oftentimes if I take over or if I invest in a business that has an owner operator that hasn't prepared in that way, a lot of times I get a better price at it because they want out. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily know how to do it. They don't know how to actually prepare their business in a way that maybe a more sophisticated investor would do it. And so sometimes I can bridge that gap mm -hmm. and sometimes I can bring them along with me, which is really exciting when I can bring them with me to get to that next phase so that they can actually still participate in some of the higher profits down the road that they couldn't maybe necessarily do themselves. As a business owner myself, like one of the hardest things is do is like letting go, right? Like letting oh, somebody yeah. handle your accounting letting somebody handle your marketing what's your advice to business owners about that like how do they just let go and trust the process i think there's a lot of ego tied to it and remember <laughs> i had the professional development uh, portion yeah. of my career and had to deal a lot with that with myself but i also see it a lot with owner operators i even see it a lot with the c-suite in a lot of businesses yeah. There's just a lot of ego tied to what I'm worth and what I am valuable for. I have four children and one of uh, my kids used to watch this show about trains, right? And this little train show is this little cartoon. The The main theme in it was, I want, I just want to be a valuable engine. I just want to be a useful engine. What do I do to be a useful engine? And I think people are sort of hardwired for that. We want to feel useful. We want to feel like we're contributing. And a lot of times that keeps us from allowing somebody that really is a great accountant or a tax professional to come in and look at our finances and our books and help us improve. Or somebody that's a great operator and them come in and do the operations that maybe you were the visionary, but not necessarily the operator for. And so a lot of times we have to put that ego aside. We have to be able to kind of check ourselves and say, okay, you know what? Honestly, ask yourself, is there somebody better at what you're doing? The answer has to be yes. And, and that's the hard part, right? The answer is yes, there is somebody. And then all the excuses start to come up and that's your ego. Your excuse is like, well, but I'm going to have to pay them so much money or I don't have the money or the finances or the revenue to pay them that. And what they don't understand is that, and I, and I try to teach this to my kids. My, one of my kids was asking me like, why do, why do you work so hard? And I'm like, well, first of all, I do what I love. So I'm not really working as hard as you think I am. It's just the perceived uh, mm -hmm. vision of it. But two, because I'm working to get things in a position where I can buy back my time. And each step of the way, that's the goal. We've got to buy back our time. And that is part of heading towards financial freedom, financial independence, financial security, all those things. And they're all different, right? So if we're buying it back, then sometimes you have to actually let go of some of the money that maybe you do have in order to get to the next level where you're making more money. Mm -hmm. And that's a big deal. So if if you look at some of the most incredible business operators, owners, visionaries of our day, Bill Gates, mm -hmm. Elon Musk, Warren Buffett, uh, we can go down the line, Mark Benioff, uh, Jeff Bezos, none of them own 100% of their company. None of them. They all maybe, if, if this, they might own 20% of their company. And this might be a surprise to a lot of owner operators or even just entrepreneurs out there. 
because we all think they own this company and that's why they're billionaires. No, actually, the truth is, is that they used this asset called equity in their business. We all know how to use it in our houses. Mm-hmm. We get an equity loan and we go get self or we go get improvements to do in the house. But we forget that we have this in business. And so as we take that and we learn to utilize that in our business, now we can pull in the people that are the best at what they do and probably better than us. Mm-hmm. And so now you look at those uh, visionaries, those great entrepreneurs, and they all have less than 20%. Some of them have less than 10% and they're billionaires. Why? Because they went and they found the people that were really great at doing the thing that they are that they do. And they put those in place so that they could earn billions instead of millions Mm -hmm. or instead of thousands, right? So they, they got the people, the who that uh, are the most important. I think the who is kind of uh, associated with like Dan Sullivan. He has a book on it. Great book. Yeah. Mike, what I'm hearing is like the difference between short-term thinking and long-term thinking, right? Because short-term thinking could be like, all right, I have to hire somebody to help me. I have to pay them, you know, X amount of dollars per year. That's a direct deduction from my balance sheet, from my, from the value of the business now. Right. Um, but in exchange, it increases the value of the business because I'm taking myself out of the business, making it easier for the next buyer or the next investor to simply take over the business. And then when a business is structured like that, when, when somebody else can take over a business, typically it, it, it's valued more. You don't right. always want to be the face of the business and always have to be directly involved in the business or else it's not really a business. It's more of just like your job, like a, a very intense job at that point. So you're, you're, you're trading like kind of the short-term thinking for the long-term thinking. Did I understand right. that correctly? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a really big deal to not necessarily always be the dancing bear. It's fine if you're looking for fame and fortune and you can still do it. Mm -hmm. You can still put yourself in a position where you can remove yourself and literally just do the thing that you love to do. And whether you understand how to do it or not, I do. I know how to get you into a position where you can literally just do the thing you love to do the most in your business and have all the other things working around you so that if I removed you for two months, a year, three years, it wouldn't matter, but you could still be in the business doing the thing you love. And that when you can find that kind of freedom, personal freedom, I'm not talking necessarily even financially, but that comes with it. But when you can find that kind of personal freedom where you can say to yourself, uh, the idea of retiring, like this isn't a weird concept. This is an industrial age concept because the thing that's going to keep us alive, the thing that keeps us active and motivated and, and excited about life is not retiring. It's about doing the thing we love to do for the rest of our life Mm -hmm. till death. Not till I retire and all of a sudden can sit around on the couch and eat Cheetos all day and watch Netflix. That's not, that's not a fulfilled life. Right. So I think we're entering into a new age out of the industrial age where the thinking has to change. It's not about retirement. It's about getting yourself the personal freedom to do the things you want to do when you want to do them and how you'd like to do them. And that to me, that's exciting. Getting, getting entrepreneurs to that space. Oh man, it's so fun. And watching, an entrepreneur getting to that place is exciting and it is so fulfilling. I absolutely 100% agree. I see that like myself with clients work with entrepreneurs, like we get into business because we love a, something, right? A passion for something. We, you know, we're really excited about it. We started a business and all of a sudden you have to write email copyright. You have to <laughs> hire, you have to know how LinkedIn works. You have to know how taxes work. And it's like, you know, I didn't sign up for this. Right. <laughs> exactly. So I get that. Is that, you know, if you have the, the process in place, right, you're able to hire others, train them pretty much a replicatable or duplicatable system in your business. Then you could focus more on the things that you love. You still own the business. You still right. own uh, the revenue, the profits from it. But this way, you've kind of put yourself in a position where you're just the owner, not the owner and 100 percent, you know, chief everything officer. Right. It's so true. Yeah. And Michael, and speaking of like what I mentioned earlier, like finding investors for a business, this is something else you do as well, right? So do you mind sharing with us more about the piece of finding outside investors for privately held businesses? Right. Well, there's what what a lot of entrepreneurs don't know, especially as they go into selling, is that there are a lot of people that are interested in buying a business or investing in a business. There are a lot of different levels of that. There are 
uh, and it goes all the way up the chain, right? So you can get some of the most sophisticated investors, which are family offices and and private equity firms that that's literally all they do. And they yeah. pull together funds and they pull together people to come and invest in businesses, but they won't invest in your business if it isn't already operating on its own. If you have to be there, forget about it. You're not even in the right range to work with those high-end yeah. companies. And in many instances, you know, you may not want to do the studying and the mm. uh, time, put in the time to get your business to that point. And so somebody else in between might buy that. I like to buy those types of businesses. I like to buy the ones in between where they're not quite ready to go to the top end, but they're not quite sure how to get into that middle range. And part of that means that I can pull investors to work with me and sometimes I, it's me and I take my capital and I put mm -hmm. it in. Sometimes I don't want to take my capital and put it in. Part of the reason I don't want to take my capital and put it in is because I might want to use it for the business to grow it yeah. and to scale it and to do the things that I need to do to get it to go to the next level. So some people might go, well, you know, if you have $500,000 sitting around in the bank, why wouldn't you just invest that in my company? And I'm thinking, well, that is not necessarily the best use of my cash. Yeah. You know, so I might want to use my cash for that and I have other businesses. So I'm using it to uh, strategically grow the companies that I have. So what I might do is I might go out and tap my network of friends that have money that they want to invest. And then I might take them and actually say, hey, you know what? Would you like to join me and be a partner in this investment? And they might not, that, that would put them as a passive investor. And yeah. so for me, I'm more of the active investor in the business side of it. And so they might look at me and they go, well, that's cool. You're an active investor. I don't want to do that. My game is oil or yeah. I sell widgets on Amazon. Cool. But I have this money and I need to do something with it. And so they might bring that and go, well, cool. You have this other investment and you're going to, you're going to tell me I'm going to get this percentage back and I'm going to get uh, to participate on the, on the exit, maybe at a higher multiple. So mm -hmm. I'm investing in two things. I'm investing on maybe getting my money back yeah. with a percentage that's more stable than the stock market. Yeah. And I'm also going to get to participate on the sale. Oh my gosh, that's, that's cool. I'm in and I don't have to actually go and and do the growth and scaling thing that you do, Michael? No, you don't. Let's do it together. And now we're partners. We go in, we invest in a business. And typically, if I'm investing in a business that's five to 10 years old, it's pretty stable. Yeah. It's, you know, and, and that's a lot more stable than the stock market. Oh, my goodness. I mean, and I'm not saying the stock market's bad if you know that and you're going to go study it and learn it. Yeah. But, you know, in terms of a business, if I have a business that has shown revenue over the last five years, now think about it, we went through a pandemic. Yeah, we went, we've gone through some ups and some downs. We've gone through some hard times. We're about to hit a little bit of what the media will call a recession. Yeah. Most businesses are going to be fine, especially the ones that have been in business for ages because they know how to handle it. They know how to weather the storm. So an investment in a business like that is a great investment for one of my partners that might come in and want to invest with me and not actually be in the part of how I'm going to install professional uh, management. Yeah. They don't care about that. They just want to know that they're going to get their, uh, their ROI back. Yeah. And that was my next question is like, why would somebody want to invest? in a business with you in a privately held business rather than just going through their mutual fund or their brokerage account and then buying stocks and, you know, publicly traded corporations. But you answered that, right? It's the stock market is, is, is volatile. I also am a big fan of like going directly to the businesses, right? Because sure. when, you, when you invest into publicly traded corporations, think about how many layers there are between you and the actual profits of the company. Right. You have Wall Street, you have the investment bankers, you have so many layers and so many fees and so many things that are going to take, they're going to eat into your profits, right? When you're sure. investing in these companies. Whereas when you invest into small, privately held businesses like the ones you're describing, you go directly to, it's like buying at wholesale. You're going directly oh, yeah. to the business. Yeah. And it's, it's also something uh, I kind of equate it to, you know, my mother loves, uh, collecting i call them little you know little monos right little little <laughs> things that she puts on her shelf and she collects them and they have memories and they have uh, meaning to her a lot of times what people don't know and they don't know about this opportunity is that they can start to collect little businesses and if you came in with me on a business and you were to have you know 10% of this business you you'd get payments out 
on a regular basis, or depending on how it's, I mean, it could be structured in so many different ways. Yeah. You could put it in so that your money is being utilized and, and being active instead of being stagnant. Mm -hmm. And now at the end of a period, you're going to get a larger amount back. Or when the business then sells to a higher on a higher multiple, again, you might get a huge chunk back. And now you might have to figure out how to do something with all that extra money. And in those cases, a lot of times the investors come back and go, well, what else do you have to invest in? Let's put something, let's put it in and let it grow somewhere else. And it's sort of like having a little trinket on your shelf and you go, mm -hmm. well, I have that, but I don't have to run that business. You know, I don't, I don't need the, uh, you know, education business that's teaching about um, 4X or yeah. I don't need that customer service thing to be part of what I'm going to run and manage and actively participate in. But I have it and it's making me money. Yeah. And that's cool because it's a little trophy on your shelf. And that's a lot of fun. It's it's a, a passive way of investing without necessarily having to go in and be the active investor. Now, see, I love it. Yeah. I love going and working with owner operators. I love finding education businesses specifically. I, I mean, but I mean, I, I invest in all sorts of things. You know, I was looking at a at a lawn care service the other day because it was fun. And this guy was passionate about it and he'd got it down. He just didn't know how to take it to the next level, mm -hmm. you know? So lots of different things you can do. And, uh, you know, we have a focus of, of education type businesses, but we also are looking at a contracting company because it was the right opportunity at the right time. And so sometimes it's about that. Yeah. yeah. And the power too of being a passive investor is it's <clears throat> great. You know, you're a limited partner, right? You're limited in the sense of control right. and in the sense of liability. So the most amount of money you can lose is your investment. What you put in. What, but whereas the active owners, the operators, the most money they can lose in theory is unlimited. Right. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's kind true. of, that's really important for the passive investor to understand that. And, you know, you're able to, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you are an engineer, you're able to focus on those things without having to uh, devote time and expertise into other areas like a lawn care business or education business. You don't need to. I think you need to do your homework, understand how the business works and how right. the type of risk is involved. But you right. don't need to go there physically. You could, you know, you're in Utah, right? You can right. be in Utah, you can invest in a business in Chicago or vice versa. Exactly. And then when you, when you have that abundant mindset, right, you're able to do more things in life where you don't have to physically be there, physically engage in things or actively engage in, into things. There's more things you can do in life when you have that mentality. Right. That's so true. And and that's what I love about it. I mean, I I have a business I'm looking at in, in Texas right now. Uh, we've, we've looked at some in California. I own one. Uh, I actually own one in Northern California. I own one in Arizona. Uh, you know, so it's it's crazy because it it's the boundaries aren't there, mm -hmm. and yet I can bring my skill set to it, and I can bring what is needed for that business that maybe they couldn't bring themselves, and or it helps them to get out. Sometimes they just want out. Sometimes it's an owner operator that's that's done. Sometimes it's not even an owner operator. They're just it's a company that's ready to be done and move on and let somebody else take over and and yeah. take their uh take their shot at making it raise. And sometimes they're just finished. Right. And then my next question would be like or or I think the audience would be listening to is why buy an existing business? Why not just build one? Oh. Well, how long could it take, right, to build a business? It's, it's really unpredictable. So do you mind sharing with the benefits of buying an existing business? Oh, my goodness. Well, first and foremost, if you are to start a business, remember I said I've bootstrapped a lot of businesses. Yeah. If you start a business, I don't care how great your idea is. I don't care what you're doing. If you start a business, the and this is, I'm not being a naysayer. I, I try to be a really yeah. positive guy. But the statistics show that if you're starting a business from scratch, the odds of it succeeding after five years is like 90% against you. Yeah. Right? So like, and it's crazy. Like the amount of chances and opportunities for you to fail within the first five years is huge. And you can look that statistic up, just yeah. Google it. You'll find tons and tons of support for it. But the funny thing is at the five year mark, starts to change it starts to go down to like 70 yeah. percent but at the 10-year mark and this is beautiful at the 10-year mark it flip-flops yeah 
instead of it being 90% chance of failure, it's a 90% chance of success, which is amazing. So when I, when I find businesses that are 10 years old and they're ready to, ready to move on or ready to get to that next phase, oh my goodness, those are always lovely because I have, I have a history. I can see what they're doing. I know the money they're bringing in. I know their up years. I know their down years. I can see inside and understand why they Mm -hmm. do good at what they do. And I can also see what things that I know from business and from all the businesses that I've worked with that could actually come in and make them grow that they might not have the resources for. So starting your own business, it's sometimes you do it, you know, like I, I just had an opportunity to do one just recently and we're taking it on another bootstrap, right? But I have the resources and I have the knowledge and, and people that I can bring to it to help it really supercharge and go fast. Mm-hmm. Whereas a lot of people starting a business, they're, they're doing everything from scratch. And like you said earlier, being the chief everything, right? Yeah. We, sometimes that's hard when you're starting a business and that gives you a higher chance of failure in that business because you're having to do everything. And that that's a big difference. When you buy a business, all those things are in place and, or there might be one piece missing or two piece missing. And now you can go back in. And that's why somebody would maybe potentially want to partner with me because they don't want to learn what that thing is that's missing. They want to just let me do it. And so I go in and I look and I go, oh, you're missing an operator. How about that? Let's put in an operator. I have a whole network full of those. Let's find one that's perfect fit for this. And everybody's happy. It's a win-win for all, all parties involved. Right. And, and because, you know, I wanted to touch on too, look, this, this podcast is called thinking like a bank, right? So I wanted to just kind of add in something where as you're talking, I'm sitting here thinking like a bank. So nice. With, with another advantage of buying an existing business is not only has it met the test, right? For success to be a successful business, but also it has cash flow coming in. It has profits coming in, which banks like to see. Typically, oh, yeah. about 85 to 90 percent of bank loans are declined. They typically only want to invest or, or loan money to existing businesses. Right. So if you find an existing business for sale, let's just use even numbers. Let's just say the value of the business is one hundred thousand dollars. I know the businesses you probably deal with are probably a little bit more than that. But let's just say it's one hundred thousand dollars. You could potentially borrow 80 percent from the bank. No, sorry. Actually, yeah. So about maybe the 70 percent from the bank and the rest, maybe 30 percent as equity, right? Same, sim- similar to real estate, how you put down a down payment and you buy a property. And then that equity could be split up amongst other limited partners in the business. So in theory, by partnering with the bank and partnering with private investors, you could essentially buy an unlimited amount of businesses, use that cash flow to pay back the loan and to pay back the investors. Did I get that right? Anything? Yeah, absolutely. Like and And the thing is, is that's just one scenario. A lot of times I don't even have to go to a bank. Yeah. In fact, sometimes the banks will slow me down yeah. because if I have partners that want to invest and they need somewhere to put their money for whatever tax advantages that they're looking for based on, again, you got to consult your tax professional, but yeah. there are lots of great tax advantages to investing your money in businesses and or with partnerships. And so I can actually sometimes be faster than that. Now, if I have to use you know, an SBA loan or yeah. a bank loan, that might be fine. And if I have a, a business that I'm investing in that has, you know, years of tax returns and proof, sometimes that is plausible and that's easier. Uh, it just depends on on the actual business and the bank mm-hmm. and who you're working with, you know, and, and that's fine. But when I can, I'll tell you this, I mean, if I cannot put any of my own capital in, yeah. I'm always going to try to do that. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, it's just a, a given like, and, and when you stop to think about it, it makes total sense. Why would I take the capital that I have and lock it up in one business? Yeah. If I know I'm investing in multiple businesses, I, I wouldn't do that. So if I can manage to take as little capital as I can out of my own pocket or create a situation where I can bring partners in and we can put that money in together, I bring the skill set, they bring the, the mm-hmm. investment because they're looking to put their money somewhere else. Yeah. Right. Then it's a win-win for all. And in some cases I can, I can invest in a business, me personally, without any money down, which is really crazy. I mean, like you do that and it blows your mind. Right. But, uh, but even if I have the money, sometimes I don't put it in either. It's a scenario based for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, yeah, like on a case by case basis, it depends. It can't just be a solid rule that you applied for every business. And kind of brings me to my next point is that like for the investor listening to this, 
you know, it doesn't have to be just liquid cash from your checking account or savings account. You right. could leverage like a 401k that you had from oh, a yeah. lawyer, an IRA, a brokerage account. You could borrow against stocks. You can even, one of the strategies we use is we use the bank on yourself concept, right? Which we've talked about on your podcast and using cash value whole life insurance to leverage. So like sure. even numbers, you have like $30,000 in cash value in your policy. You could leverage like 25,000, 20,000 you take out of that policy or you, you actually leverage it. You borrow against it. You're not yeah. subtracting from it. Then you, you can invest in one of the businesses through your network. And then even to, to take it a step further, the way you invest in the business could be, uh, could change, right? Like you mentioned this earlier, you can either loan money to the business where you are in essence, the bank, you right. can, you know, create a structure where I'll give you 25,000 today for the next two or three years, just pay me back interest only. Like we could say 10%, which is probably a good rate for, uh, from a private money perspective. Exactly. 10% interest only per month, you pay me back. And then at the end of that, you could do capital or principal back or maybe principal plus some sort of other multiple right. that's correlated with the value of the business or the sale of the business. Or we could just do equity where I buy shares of the business and then some sort of dividend distribution or some sort of way of getting cash flow back out of the business or maybe not, right? Maybe it's just I buy shares at a certain price and I hold on to them until two or three or four years from now and then we sell and there's a multiple where potentially you could double or triple your money. I'm not giving any promises where if you invest with Michael, you'll triple your money, but- <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> but that that's typically why people invest in privately held businesses and yeah. in private real estate deals like syndications, and funds that hold real estate is, is usually to double their money every right. four or five years. That's typically the goal. Well, and, and you said it. I mean, things like your own equity in your house. I mean, maybe you have 100000 yeah. in equity in your house that you can use, and it's just sitting there doing nothing. Yeah. And yeah. it's not even earning you money. And yeah. maybe the maybe the housing market's going to go down, or maybe it's going to go up. But if you're living in your house for the next 20 years, 30 mm -hmm. years, or you yeah. don't ever, you're not planning on selling it ever. And you have that money sitting there. Gosh, you could go invest in a business and get one of the terms that you're talking about. And sometimes it's brilliant, you know, sometimes yeah. it's a brilliant uh, place to be. And, and, you know, if a business that's been in, in, uh, in business for five years, 10 years, you're looking pretty good. I mean, yeah. it's, it's going to be a pretty sweet investment. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this is actually one of my favorite topics to talk about, just privately held businesses. We have another episode about this coming out soon, just about in, the, the benefits of investing, you know, skipping Wall Street and going directly into private, privately held businesses. Sure. How can listeners learn more about this topic as well as more about you and your business? Well, we, uh, as you mentioned earlier, you are on our podcast, so they should come and hear your episode for sure. Uh, our podcast is business or biz yeah, business choreo, mm -hmm. choreography. Uh, and so you can find that on all the channels. It's everywhere. Uh, you can go to our website at bizchoreo.com and uh, check us out. And there's probably all the information you need on those two places. If you check out the podcast or even just the website, we'll be able to help you out in whatever you need, or just feel free to reach out to me. We're pretty easy and mm -hmm. we've got a great team. So if you message me in Facebook, LinkedIn, somewhere, we'll get back to you pretty quick. Awesome, Michael. It was a pleasure interviewing you, and I'm looking forward to bringing you back on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, good luck with everything with the, with the podcast. It's a great show. Thank you. To learn more about what we do and how we can help you grow more wealth, please visit www.finassetprotection.com. That's F-I-N, assetprotection.com. The topics presented in this podcast are for general information only and not for the purposes of providing legal, accounting, or investment advice. On such matters, please consult a professional who knows your specific situation.